the maids you'll water in the evening time they say one day Isaac sent his servant to stop prepared come on her way my man that sent me here to tell thee See the jewel and rich and rare Was thou not his lovely bride In that country over there It shall be loud in the to invite your attention and ask for your prayers as we notice chapter 28 of that beautiful book of beginnings, Genesis 28 and verses 16 and 17, including at 19. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. I'd like to lift as a thought from the 17th verse the three words that found in the closing sentence of the verse, verse number 17, the house of God. That's a subtopic. I'd just like to talk about God's house. God's house. Now, even the term house is not an unusual and unknown term to most of us. In a simple sense, the term house means a dwelling place. And from the scriptures, there are many scriptures dealing with house that expand the thought beyond a dwelling place, but the significant thought of a dwelling place means that it is different from a temporary dwelling, but has as a deeper sense the sense of being a permanent dwelling place, some sense of permanency, an abode for humans. Then the word house can mean family. In the seventh chapter of Genesis, in the first verse, the Lord spoke unto Noah, and these were his words, he said to him, Thou and all thy house shall enter into the ark. What he meant by that was the members of his family were called a house. But I would like for us to consider the preeminent spiritual significance of Jacob's dream and Jacob's vision 
as he journeyed from Beersheba going toward Haran. I believe that there are deep and important prophetical and typical significances in that 28th chapter that edify the church, inspire believers, and encourage our hearts in walking with the Lord. Do we notice in the 10th verse that Jacob is going out from his father's house down into Syria looking for a wife? And if I might across the size a few verses from the 28th chapter, I'd just like to notice the 11th verse with you and move down toward the text where he lights upon a certain place. And I think that we could consider that the church is a place of comfort. The church is a place of consolation. There we find him laying down in a place to sleep. What an odd place for man to find comfort. There in the wilderness, on the way to Syria, he lays down and uses some stones as a pillow. He finds comfort in that place, even that he is able to fall asleep, feeling secure in the hands of God. In the 12th verse, we have a dream of the church. He dreamed and beheld a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. I wish I had more time to cross the size of the 12th verse and to separate the thoughts. From the 12th verse, I consider that as he dreamed that dream of the church, he dreamed the dream of God mediating between God and men. This is no empty vision. Neither is it a dream without meaning. I've thought on the various dreams of dreamers in the Bible. I was considering Jacob or Joseph's dream, and he dreamed a prophetical dream as he looked at the sheaves of his brothers bowing down to him, foreshadowing all men bowing down to Christ. Joseph being in the line of Christ, there he was typical of Christ. And there we find his brothers bowing down to him. But as we look in the 12th verse and behold Jacob's dream, I consider it a dream of the church, that the church is a place where God meets men and men meet God, a meeting place. This meeting place between men and God is only made possible by the priestly act of mediation of God bringing men to him by his shed blood on Calvary. I look at that 12th verse and I think that the church is a place where the communication of God's servants, the angels serving his servants is portrayed in that 12th verse, that in the church, St. Paul said, we are in this place called Holy Mount Zion. and said, we've come into the pillar and ground of truth into an innumerable company of angels that we have as our company and as our servants, the elect angels sent out from God who become servants of the servants of God in the church. Jacob perhaps did not understand this dream completely, and he was not perhaps able to understand fully what we understand now, but I believe that we could say safely that the church is a place that God has placed himself, that in the earth he's come down as a mediator between God and men. St. Paul informs us that the only mediator between God and men, where it was impossible for men to reach up into heaven and enjoy the heavenly fellowship of God had it not been for God instituting and forming and creating the church by his own handiwork, making it possible for men to have that divine fellowship that was broken by Adam in the garden. Jacob sees it as a ladder. Then in the 13th verse, he sees the preeminence of God in the church. and says, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Jehovah Elohim, of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the land whereon thou liest to thee, will I give it into thy seed. I believe that the church can be said to be the place where Christ is preeminent and should be and is preeminent in the hearts of all believers. You perhaps would not be able to see this in some places that are proclaiming they are the church, those that have left the landmark of what the church really is and have missed the genuine significance of salvation and the saviorhood of God and the spiritual ethics and morals of Christ, that the church becomes just a social institution, 
just another social institution where we gather to discuss politics or to discuss history and philosophy. But the church in the mind of God has never been ordained for those purposes which many people have reduced it to in our day. It is a tremendous discredit that the house of God or God's house has been reduced to a place for the raffling of automobiles, the playing of bingo games, and the serving of beer in the church basement for the building fund. But when Jacob dreamed this dream of salvation and the church, he saw the house of God as a place where God stood preeminently above all those around him or in any way associated with him at all. And I reach the 14th verse, and we get a revelation of the house of God as being that place of blessing of the church in Jesus. For there he foresees the great prophecy of the seed, that seed that is sprung up from that corn of wheat that fell into the ground. Our Lord Jesus Christ, through his death, St. John was as a corn of wheat that fell into the ground that brought forth the seed that you see sitting in these seats. Seed to be as the dust of the earth. That the members of the house of God are termed the seed as the dust of the earth and spread abroad to the west and to the east. The great Pentecostal evangelism of the New Testament church is there foreshadowed in the 14th verse. And I'm still preaching on the house of God. The church has lost its evangelical prayer. That church or that group or that individual in the church who has lost his evangelical fervor, has missed the mind of Christ in the New Testament church. One of the last commandments of Jesus Christ was, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. If there's anywhere where evangelism is being proclaimed and where it's being taught, where it's being appropriated and believed, it certainly ought to be in the house of God. And we find disciples of all kinds have gone forth with various evil philosophies, but the church has one supreme mission, and the big business of God is not material, but preeminently spiritual. And if that which is material is associated with the house of God, does not promate and promulgate the evangelistic doctrine of spreading abroad the gospel of Jesus Christ, then the church is not the house of God. In the 14th verse, thy seed shall be spread to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. In the 15th verse, that we see the house of God as a place where God meets us. In a personal sense, now we see Jacob having a revelation of that wonderful God of our salvation in that Jehovistic title, Shama, which means Jehovah Shama, the Lord is with thee. And if there's anywhere where God is with men and women, it's in the house of God. And believers have a special affiliation and a very special and unique association with God that other men do not have. It is true that our God in his wonderful justice causes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust and causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. But for believers who have been baptized into Christ and who are intimately connected with Christ by the spiritual union of the birth of water and spirit, not only does the rain fall on us, but we are full of the rivers of living water. Jesus said in the seventh chapter of St. John, the 37th verse, talking about the house of God and the members of the church that said out of their belly should flow rivers of living water. Not just drops, but rivers, 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 endless rivers of refreshing, personal and intimate refreshing in Christ. Endless rivers of thirst quenching waters of the spirit that satisfy the deepest, most innermost needs, the most intimate needs of that spiritual essence of men and women are found and discovered by us over here in the house of God. Prior to us coming into the house of God, many of us were like the woman that sat on the side of the well. Jesus met as he ministered in the earth. But the Bible tells us he sat down on the side of the well and began to confess her need for Christ. She had had six husbands and even then was involved in an intimate union. But it was because this woman had not discovered this living water, which is in Jesus Christ. There was that deep yearning. There was that deep quest for something that could not be satisfied by illicit activities. It could only be met by having an intimate union with that waters of refreshing found in the house of God, that living fountain open in the house of David, 
that God gives to his children as a personal experience. Christ, the bread of life, and Christ, the waters of life, even everlasting life. You move down and looking at the house of God prophetically, and those are scriptures associated with the text defined in the 16th verse, a spiritual awakening. Where will a man be more awakened? And where can he be more awakened and awake than he can be in the house of God? For one who is in God's house is as one born again of water and spirit. The awakening talks about spiritual sight. But there had been stars, there had been dreams, there had been other trips that Jacob had been on before. But until he is spiritually awakened, he does not realize the power of God that is available for his life and for the lives of others who would accept him. This is why it's so necessary to be born again. I ask you the question, can an unborn child with 2020 vision see? And the answer to that is no. But once the child is born, those eyes become open to all the surroundings around it. Thus it is with anyone who comes into the house of God. Members of the house of God who've been born again of water and of spirit are spiritually born and awakened to the gloriousness of Christ in their lives. Christ in the universe, Christ in the society, he's awakened. And he makes a testimony, surely the Lord is in this place of the discovery of the touch of God. There we find Exodus that Moses does not know that God is present there in that burning bush until a special phenomenon of the Holy Spirit sets the bush on fire. There the bush begins to burn, and burn is not consumed. His eyes are of the Holy Spirit, and God speaks out of the bush and informs him, you are standing on holy ground in the midst of the God of the heavens and the earth. Joshua does not understand that the man with the sword by his side is not just an ordinary soldier until the revelation comes from the lips of the angel that says, I am the captain of the Lord's host. Where else can a man discover God like him? he can discover him in the house of God? There are discoveries in nature that those who believe that God is inherent in the earth can look at a flower, they can look at a plant, they can discover some essence of God in the stars of the universe, they can look around at the natural universe and say there must be a God somewhere. But never is a man able to be awakened to the reality and the power and the grace and graciousness and greatness of Christ like he is awakened when he's born again of water and spirit in the house of God. It's an awakening that brings all nature into harmony with science and the Bible. We are not worshipers of the sun and the moon and the stars, but we are worshipers of the God who created the sun, the moon, and the stars. We are worshipers of the God who created the rivers that run down into the sea. We are worshipers of the God who made all the universes and who controls them by his wonderful power. And as we move down to the 18th verse, the house of God is so typical there. As we see Jacob rising up in the morning and we see here some parts of the house typified by the materials used. Where he takes a stone, causes my mind to think on the house of God in a spiritual sense, be having a found and I want to say that Jesus is that foundation. Paul said of the foundation can no man lay than that which is laid. God's house has an undergirding foundation that is eternal because God himself is the foundation of this house. Here the analogy of the church of the house of God being likened to a house expressed in Genesis and taken up in many scriptures in the Bible elsewhere. But in Ephesus Paul says, that the house that the church is like a house. And in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, he says this house has foundations. And in leaving there the foundation, the principles of the doctrine and going on to perfection, he draws a great spiritual picture of the house of God having a foundation and having walls and having a roof over it. Then in the Song of Solomon, the house of God is likened into having windows. And he said, there at the window, Christ looks in at the window. Paul declares that it is a church that has a tried foundation. We are lively stones in the walls, built up a spiritual house, edifying one another in the body of Jesus Christ. Where could you find the fellowship that we know that we have in the house of God? David looked at the fellowship we are enjoying in the house of God in the 133rd chapter 
of the book of Psalms and he said how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. If there's unity anywhere, it's in God's house. It's a spiritual fellowship. It's the bond of the spirit. It's the bond of peace and the fellowship of the spirit that binds us together, that brings Matthew the publican together with Peter the fisherman and Paul, that self-righteous, heretical Pharisee, together in humility with men like Peter who are unlearned and unskilled. Where else can you find fellowship that is like this fellowship we enjoy in God's house? A fellowship with God and a fellowship with the brethren. And as we reach there tonight in the 19th verse, and that great text begins to open up to us in the 17th verse, rather, where he says that this is the, how dreadful is this place. And this is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. That there are those who despise the church and look upon it as an outmoded and worn out institution. But the Bible said that it's the house of God and the gateway to heaven. My God, the church has not outlived her usefulness and outlived her gift of virtue for the salvation of many women. Where else can many women hear the gospel preached in its fullness except in a place that is truly the house of God? Where else are their souls gathered together with one supreme purpose of ministering to the sick and speaking to those who are dying, encouraging the hopeless with a heart of pity and tender love for all men everywhere except in the house of God. There it is gathered that blessed fellowship of spirit filled believers who have a significant purpose in the hand of God as being those who discovered that this is the gateway to heaven. It makes me know that God has a way to be saved. And that way is through Jesus Christ and the missile or the instrument of the baptized body of believers, which is the church that has been placed in the world to instruct men as to which way is the gateway to heaven. There's only one gateway this afternoon. As we gather here in the services from the house of God, as the gospel has declared, there's one Lord and one faith and one baptism. And that there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. This discovery is made in the house of God. There's dedication going on in God's house. Jacob dedicates the stone. There are offerings being poured out. Drink offerings are poured out on that stone in God's house. Tithes are paid. Sacrifices are offered in God's house. All of this makes up God's house. But supremely important above all is that Jesus Christ is his own house. He said, I am the door to this house. I am the way into this house. I am the foundation of this house. This house is named after my name. And all the inhabitants in God's house of the whole family in heaven and earth are called by the name of Jesus. What a wonderful place this is, the dwelling place of God. In my father's house are many mansions. In the original Greek word, it means many stages on the way. As we gather in this physical building and hear the word of God and are born again, a water and a spirit is just a place in the mansions of God, a stage on the way to the perfect age. Here, sometimes the house of God finds itself assailed by the enemies of the church. Sometimes it is lied upon. Sometimes it is persecuted. Sometimes it's crucified, even as the Lord was. But as the church stops at this stage on the way, Jesus Christ points out that there is a perfect aid for the house of God, where the wicked have ceased from troubling, and the weary are at rest, where death cannot reach the believer, where disappointment cannot reach our lives. In my Father's house is a sure dwelling place. I'm just tending here for a while. I'm just passing through for a while, but I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, eternal in the heavens, one that Abraham looked for, one that Jacob looked for, one that the apostles looked for, and one that Jesus Christ preached about. But the city lies for square wide in my father's house, for the foundation of twelve kinds of precious stone, for the gates are made of pearl that open wide for believers. But the sound of the choir is singing one continual song. Amen. Why they is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In my father's house, there is peace in this house. In my father's house, there's fellowship with God and men. In my father's house, there's
as the bread of life and the bread of heaven. In my Father's house are water from an everlasting fountain. In my Father's house are the clothing of righteousness and the shoes of the gospel. In my Father's house is life evermore in Jesus Christ our wonderful Lord. Hallelujah. Bless his great name. Who wants to come this morning? I think I'm just going to sing a couple of choruses for that beautiful hymn. In God's house. You may have been coming in and going out of churches until this time. You may not have discovered there's something different about this place. In the Father's house, a dramatic, significant change. Such a great change took place. That experience with God was so traumatic. It was so moving. It was so inspirational. When he got up from that dream, he said, this place has been called love. But from this time on, since I met God, since I met Jesus, even since he brought me into the presence of angels, in the presence of the courts of God, reached down and picked me up, and carried me upon the ladder of heaven, I could behold the mighty majesty of heaven. We're going to change the name of this place to Bethel, which means God's house. My friend, you may have been a Luz before you got here, but if you're really in God's house, there's a significant change. Every child of God that has been transformed, that has been translated into the kingdom of his dear son, has witnessed a soul-saving, spirit-searching, deep, significant change, a change name, a change in location, a change in the places you used to go, a change in the thoughts that you once thought that were sinful. He said, brethren, I'm going to change the name of this place. No longer will it be Luz, which means an almond tree. There's a tree in this, all right, but it's a place called Calvary. Hallelujah. No longer almond tree. Well, let's call this place where we have fellowship with God. And he has fellowship with us. Where he has mediated between the righteousness of God. For the flaming sword of the law demands justice for our sin. And his blood covers and brings us together by his own death. And call this place best hell. Which means the house of God. Who'd like to be changed this evening? Something should have happened to you since you got here today. said, I never knew there were people like those people. When I first came to the church, I never knew there were any people like the saints. I looked at those people. I said, you know, these people are different. There's something different about these people. And even this service is different. I didn't get saved the first Sunday, but I got saved the next Sunday. Amen. And I, I want to say God has changed things. In God's house. God can take the wine heads and make water drinkers out of them. He can take thieves like Matthew. When you get him in God's house, you can change him from Levi the thief to Matthew, a child of God. Reach down and get men who are like Peter, who are ignorant and unlearned men, and who curse sometimes, and change their name from Cephas to Peter, and give them the keys of the kingdom. Be such a dramatic change in God's house. My friend, if you're a member in somebody's church, sign your name on the roll. Went under watch care. Went through all of the rituals. Said a number of apostles, creeds, our fathers, and Hail Mary. And signed the dogma. Went back on the sidewalk and still smoking your cigarette. You are not in God's house. And then the God of the house is not in you. For your bodies become temples of the Holy Ghost. And you've got a house in a house. Amen. God's houses and God's cities in the city. When the Holy Ghost comes in a man's life, there's a dramatic change. There's a change in his speech, his action, his walk. There's such a great change. Until the Bible said, if any man be in Christ, the change is so great, he is a new creature, which in the Greek means new creation in God's house. No way under the sun that so-called nominal Christians can be in the church and still doing the same things they did before they got in the house of God. Only have a nominal religion. Said, I belong to such and such a church. And 
This is my creed. This is my faith. If you're still telling the same lies, drinking the same drink, committing the same immoralities, frequenting the same bars, have the same motives, and mistreating your companions and those around you, my friend, you are not in God's house. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, transformed, translated, regenerated, renewed, made new to the washing of the waters of regeneration by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Is there anyone today who would like to be saved? Jacob was a changed man from that hour. He got up giving. He got up making sacrifices. He awakened with a vision. Went on down on his journey. I don't know where you're headed for when you stop by here today. But I said to a man this week, I sat in his office, I talked to him about receiving the Holy Ghost. I said, brother, whatever you are doing, if it is an act of trying to help people and lift society, when you get the Holy Ghost, you can do it better. I don't know what kind of journey you may be on, what kind of a vocation or goals or ambitions. But after he had that vision and that anointing and that dream, he got up and went on his way. He journeyed on. There's something about being in the church, friend, that can help you to journey on this morning. There are folks sitting in here now who just feel so discouraged, perhaps, and feel as though life isn't worth living. But a face-to-face -face view with Jesus Christ in the presence of the angels and a touch of the Spirit of God will give you grace to take the pillar and turn it into a pillar. Get up on your feet and go on your way, a new man, a new woman with a new vision and a new hope, new inspiration, a whole new life. Who wants to come this morning? I'm going to sing a few courses of that old hymn, Come and Go With Me to My Father's House. That's why you see us inviting people. Say, come on, get saved. Come on, get the Holy Ghost. Come on, be renewed. If you're backslidden, come on back in my Father's house. In my Father, everything.